Hey there, my name is Shane Craddock and this is the Inner Edge podcast where I share a different take on how to lead and live a sustainable high performance life. Over the course of different episodes, I'm going to challenge the belief that tension, stress and struggle are essential to success and creativity. My experience is that there's an easier way, there's a better way and indeed there's an essential way that we need to explore for the times that we live in. So let's go ahead, let's jump in and explore. Hi there, welcome to today's show, uh, which is all about golf. Now, before you even switch off, um, I would encourage you to stay with this one. Even if you don't like golf or you don't play it or you hate golf even, um, I I assure you that I think there'll be something here for you. Uh, and if there isn't, well, anyway, you know, you're not going to waste that much time. Right. <laughs> so the title is Learning from Golf, Even If You Don't Like It, Slash Play It, Slash Hate It. Um, and it's funny, as I was reflecting on what am I going to share in this episode, I realized I've got way too much content. So I'm not too sure. I'm going to figure out some some other way to use the content. Because as I started to think about it, I thought, wow, there's probably 20 kind of key points I could share here. But I'm, <clears throat> I'm just going to pick a couple that I think will resonate. And obviously, in the previous episode to this, um, part three of um, a Twist and Be More Audacious, uh, I was using the analogy that I got from... Uh, top golfer Wayne Westner around how to hold a golf club. And I was just sharing that in, in relation to how I would see holding on to your outcomes or your goals. Um, and if you haven't heard that one, maybe go back and listen to it. Um, so this is kind of a, I suppose, a, a, a lead in from that, the thread of that. Um, and I do think my, my experience is that you can learn a lot from golf um, to help you in anything, because I think the underlying principles to succeed in golf are universal. They can be applied to everything, to any sport, but also to business and also to life. And there are obviously a lot of, I think, parallels and similarities, but there's also plenty of differences. You know, if you're running a business or a leader in a business, yeah, you could be inspired by certain things that we're going to share here. But obviously, in my view, business is a, is a much more complex animal. Um, that There's a lot more to it and there's a lot more, uh, there's actually quite a lot of skill in business. Um, I think golf i'm not going to even go down this rabbit hole never golf at least is quite linear in terms of what you have to focus on having said that i suppose one of the key points to lead us into this episode is that golf does require a multi-dimensional approach and what about what i mean by multi-dimensional is that the, the top golfers today they focus on things that perhaps 20 30 years ago wouldn't have been focused on more than perhaps a lot of sports people. So, for example, when I say multidimensional, I mean they focus on the physical in terms of their their exercise, their nutrition. Um, it's, a, it's a key element for the top golfers in the world. Um, they also focus on their mind. So the mental side is one of the dimensions. Increasingly, also what you're seeing with golf is that they, that they will talk about managing their emotions. So their emotional side is another dimension. Um, you see this coming through also in business in terms of emotional intelligence or empathy. Or emotional quotient and there's a fourth dimension also which <clears throat> i believe you're going to hear um over the next decade perhaps you'll see threads of it coming through it's it's on the spirit side and when i say spirit i don't necessarily at all mean religious i mean more to do with um a deeper connection with themselves almost the joie de vivre or va va boom or when somebody's up and connected and in the zone there's this kind of a sense of spirit or flow about them and that's a whole other conversation but if the top golfers are focusing on those multi-dimensions, why? It's because they want to get the edge. Um, so why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't you? No matter what you're in. And um, to, just to kind of go back a little bit in terms of explaining my own connection with golf, apart from growing up in a house where my dad was a obsessive golfer, and a good golfer, I think he got down to maybe five or six handicap, and I would have caddied with dad for many years and was lucky enough as well to have met with him and go do a round of golf with Christy O'Connor Sr. Um, and as I've gone on, I don't, I used to play a reasonable amount of golf um, before I kind of got into, into this kind of stuff. And then I stopped just more from a time point of view. But there was a period going back about uh, 20 years where myself and two others started a business and we were training um, on the mind and also on nutrition, a lot of what I what I do today, 
perhaps, hopefully this doesn't sound egotistical, a little bit ahead of our time, but when we were trying to sell this workshop or program about mental fitness, this is back in 2000, 2001, and we're trying to sell it to business people, it just didn't get off the ground, it didn't sell. Um, there just wasn't any interest really or appetite for it. And then one of the guys, uh, one of the three said, who, who himself was an obsessive golfer said, why don't we try this with golfers? I, I think it might work with golfers. So, so we said so we try and sell it to golfers. So the same people we went back and said, actually, we're doing this thing on golf. Bizarrely, it sold out really quickly, <laughs> which I found fascinating. And it wasn't a cheap program at the time. Um, we kind of just rejigged a couple of things, but essentially it was 80% the same program structure, 80% the same content, and we just geared it towards golfers. And it worked really well. And I always remember towards the end of the program, one of the people there said to me, Do you know, I'm getting a lot out of this for my golf, but I've just realized something. I think a lot of this might work in my business life as well. And even for me personally, what do you think? I just had to laugh because I, I, I told him the truth. I said, well, you know, <laughs> that's what we designed it for. <laughs> This is just a way in to kind of get us moving. Um, and actually out of that came a meeting with Wayne Westner and then that led to doing some work with some golfers. Um, and at one point, just being honest, I'll share it here, uh, I had considered would I kind of explore the, the golf and sports side more seriously. Um, but in the end, I kind of felt more calling into business. But having said that, a lot of my clients of business uh, would very often ask me to, to work with somebody who, you know, uh, is in sport that they knew. So I've, I've actually still worked with quite a few golfers, um, mostly at the kind of the top end of the amateur side, um, and also some Gaelic footballers, hurlers, soccer players, runners. It's not my main thing, but I, I'm only saying this because just to kind of assure you that I'm not just talking blindly from having read a book. It's it's actually based on on practical work. So I'll just share, I'll share, I'm sharing from that experience is what I'm saying. So... <clears throat> The first thing I'm going to say before I come into one of the key points is what's your approach to life? Is it multidimensional or is it is it less than that? A lot of people only focus on one element of those four dimensions, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Um, and again, spiritual, not, not religious, but where could you improve? And if the top sports people, the top golfers are looking at those multidimensionals, multidimensions to get an edge, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? I thought I would take a little moment to um, highlight something that you may not be aware of, especially if you're new to these podcasts um, and maybe to some of what I do, that um, a few years ago, I, I brought out a book called Inspire Me, Life Wisdom to Pass On. And uh, it's a very uh, personal book, something that came from the heart, I think, more than anything else. Um, I, Ever since my personal breakdown in my mid-20s, I have... Uh, collected quotes as as a hobby in fact it was my mother who kind of inspired me to do it i explained why in the book but if you're interested um the book is available on on amazon uh, uh, internationally um and i think if you're looking for something that's easy to dip in and out of it kind of is designed to be read each of the nuggets are designed to be read in kind of less than 60 seconds and the way the book is structured there are um i think it's 10 chapters with kind of 10 kind of key points in each chapter. Each chapter is a different area of life um, and also business and health and things like that and my perspective on it. But what I've always loved about quotes is that, you know, they can be quite inspiring. But what I also used to observe for myself and for other people was that you might, somebody might, might, might rattle off a quote, but not be living any of the wisdom of the quote. And so I became fascinated with that. And that's kind of what started me on the journey of writing my weekly email, which is also called Inspire Me, which was the seeds really for what has become the book. I'm still writing, obviously, the weekly email now, I don't know, was it 12 years later? We started in, I think it's 2008, so it's 13 years later. Um, but the book has done exceptionally well. It's 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 shocked me, surprised me, delighted me with who has ended up reading it all over the place. And I get notes and emails all the time from people that I never met, just telling them the difference that it's made, which has been very heartening from my point of view. Anyway, it's available, as I say, primarily through Amazon, Um uh, if you're in Ireland, it might also be available in Easons um, and perhaps Dubray Books. Um, so <clears throat> Inspire Me by Shane Craddock is the book. And uh, yeah, that's it. Back to the show. Um, so one of the key things 
I wanted to share from my own reflection here for this episode is peak performance or optimal performance or whatever you want to call it lives in the zone of a still mind in golf, a calm mind. And obviously that's very true in any context that peak performance lives in the zone of a calm mind. Um, and I, I recall working with somebody who was a very talented golfer, um, a top amateur golfer. And I've been asked just to have a chat with them because they were getting a reputation in their mind and with somebody who was helping them around choking. And choking is one of those words in golf you just don't want to hear. Uh, <laughs> it's choking under pressure, choking when you kind of get into the final few holes to win a tournament. Um, and it can happen to the best of the best. And when we got into this conversation, it was very clear that he was kind of psyching himself out of, out of his own performance. And again, I think that can be very true um, in, in business or in life, particularly in business, though. And so I'm going to use three kind of categories here, past, present, and future, maybe to kind of explain and hopefully highlight the points I'm talking about. So <clears throat> what was very clear was that when he wasn't in competition, this guy, uh, he had no problem really being in the in the moment. And if you're if you're able to kind of lock yourself in the moment, and I just have a calm mind, which isn't, you know, which is a mind that isn't getting distracted with thinking or worry or stress, or it doesn't create any tension. Uh, well, then whatever talent you have has a chance to come out. And that's exactly the same in business. And also what you'll find in business, even in meetings, for example, is that while you might be physically present, most people's minds are not present. They're distracted off somewhere else, thinking about what they're going to say, or they're thinking about lunch, or they're thinking about what was said an hour ago. The one place they're not is in the moment. And if you're a golfer, you're screwed if that's the way you are. So understanding that being able to create a, a calm mind under pressure is a skill. It's an inner skill. And that this is something that I think as business people or in life, because it relates to even, you know, a, a conversation with a close person, a relationship, the more present you are, the more you squeeze out of life. So <clears throat> what we did was... Um, work with this guy to understand to help him understand and this is I guess the purpose of what I do today but also in terms of this podcast is just to highlight some areas where you can reflect yourself on your own inner side your own inner world and start to get a better understanding of how that inner world works and when you do so the understanding with practice whatever that practice may be whether it's meditation or some sort of mindfulness or whatever it is just whatever works for you I guess it's an important element in terms of understanding how to calm your mind under pressure or when you're in those pressure situations. Because if you don't have an understanding, if you don't practice anything uh, before you get onto the course of life or the course of business, uh, then you're going to have problems. So <clears throat> think back perhaps to a time when you were at your best. You know, what, what was your mind like when you were there? My guess is that it was very calm. Um, and now you've got to ask yourself, well, okay, how do you calm your mind? Or do you, do you just leave it to chance? Increasingly, what you're going to see in sport and in, in, uh, in golf in particular is that this is going to be the skill, is that how do you genuinely bring a deep sense of calm with you onto the golf course and maintain it? Not the easiest thing in the world to do, especially when there's so, so much potentially at stake. Um, so understanding your inner world is a key element to creating a space for a calm mind. And... The second thing point then is around, and I'm not forgetting about past, present, and future, but tension is the enemy of the golfer, tension. Um, and that, I think that's also true in business and life, even though I think in business it's almost see, we're, we almost accept it as part of the game. Um, yet in golf, you know, if you bring tension into golf, it, it affects the flexibility and the fluidity of your muscles and your movement. And so it can compromise how you take a shot um, and also your decision making. And I think that's directly relevant to leadership and business. And I think within this, now there's multiple areas that can affect your attention. Ultimately, it's down to interference mentally, inner interference. And one of the uh, strong areas that brings in your interference is a misuse of memory. So with the golfer that I was talking about, who uh, was concerned about the choking, what was very clear was that he was misusing his memory. So he'd had one bad experience where he'd lost a competition that he should have won in his mind. And he kept on replaying that memory. And because he was replaying that memory, 
he was bringing in anxiety and ultimately led to high tension. And this would come in in other competitions now, understandably. And when you don't understand how your mind works, when you don't understand how memory works, um, and you have low skill level, a sk low skill threshold around managing your attention and where it goes, you can very easily fall into the trap of misusing your memory. That it, your mind will just throw up different things at different times. And so this, this is where awareness comes in and also being able to be present and sensitive to what's coming into your mind. So once he understood that controlling in a way the memories that you bring in, he was able to then, you know, move away from the negative memory that was causing anxiety or tension and focus before the game in particular on practice recalling positive memories. And I think, again, that's something that you can bring into your context of your day. I'll often talk to clients about at the start of their day, the first hour in particular, making sure you prime that time, use it very, very well, because it's the most important hour of the day in my mind. One of the things I would suggest as an experiment is do what golfers do. Maybe not all golfers, I don't know, but it's certainly what I did with this golfer and it worked, is where you're starting off your day, bringing up memories where you played very well. And you can do the same thing in business. Um, and what you're doing is conditioning your mind to remind it that, okay, no, no, that's also possible. I have a choice. I can direct my attention into a bad memory or a good memory. So that's that, that, that's the past. And again, regardless of what was going on and go back to the clear mind, we, we also did work out a routine to help him, this guy for clear his mind. And then also, this is when he was coming up to take a shot. And then also to relax and take a focused shot. But it also, it had to be underpinned by a clear and logical understanding of how your inner world works. And then the, the third point I'm going to talk about, which relates to the future, is uh, what I would call with my clients, the, the missile analogy. I'm not going to spend too long on this now, but essentially the missile analogy is your mind works like a missile. It, it, it goes where you focus on. So if you're focused on a negative outcome, it, you're t you tend to kind of move in that direction. If you're focused on a positive outcome, you tend to move in that direction. And, and so in terms of the future, it's very important for a golfer to kind of, with a clear mind, with a balanced mind as a foundation, that they focus on where do they want the ball to go. And if you're talking to an amateur golfer or somebody who hasn't really understood some of this element, you know, if they come up to a hole that previously they hit it into the water four or five times, more than likely the memory's going to throw that up as what they want to do. And so they're going to try to probably overcompensate, but I need to hit it out to the left, really not realizing at the back of their mind that they're seeing it going into the water. So your mind is like a missile. It goes, <laughs> it goes where you focus. So <clears throat> more than likely it's going to go into the water. Whereas if you're in the mind of a top professional, they will see the ball as an outcome going where they want. Does it guarantee that that happens all the time? No, but is it more probable? Yes. And again, that's a skill. So what I would say to you is, <clears throat> where do you want the ball to go? What outcomes are you focused on? Are you playing in your mind the negative outcomes from the past or the negative outcomes of the future? Or perhaps even are you focusing on where you want the ball to go actually and seeing it going there? And there's an incredible difference in terms of the results and the experience, but just even reflecting on what I'm saying here, and hopefully it's making some sense um, without going into it too deeply, but the past, the memory, the present about clearing your mind in the moment, take a shot, and then the future to say, well, where do I want the ball to go? Ultimately coming back to the present moment, because to me, that's the grounding place for a top performer to be in the present moment, not to stay in the past, not to stay in the future, use them constructively, but to live more and more in the present. So what are the memories you could bring into your day going forward? What are, where do you want the ball to go? What are the outcomes you're focused on? And then what are you doing every day to cultivate a calm, clear mind, especially under pressure? So the inner side of golf is seen as being critical to the top professionals in the world. And they work on it daily. And, and I think there's still a lot more to go from what I can see. There's definitely more edges that I think a lot of them haven't discovered yet. But why do they focus on it? To get the edge. Thanks for being with me. Bye-bye.